Well, we're back with the next session, session 42. We're going to begin looking at Ephesians chapter 4, one of the four passages that deal with spiritual gifts. We've looked at the other ones in detail, and in the next three sessions, we'll be looking at Ephesians 4 in more detail. In the last session, I talked about possible spiritual gifts. I mentioned the gifts of craftsmanship, creative communication, celibacy, martyrdom, missionary, voluntary, poverty, and I explained what people believe those gifts entail, and then I also explained why I do not believe they are spiritual gifts, while they are very uh, noble and worthwhile activities for those of us who follow Christ. I mentioned three criteria that I used, that a gift had to be listed in the New Testament, there had to be evidence of its use today, and that it had to be linked to the word charisma. Well, in today's session, we're going to give an overview of the section of Ephesians chapter 4 that we'll be studying in more detail. Then in the next two se sessions, we'll take a look at two of the parts of this particular passage. So we will be studying Ephesians 4 from verse 11 down through verse 16. We will not be studying from 17 on because that portion does not deal with spiritual gifts. I know that many countries around the world have something called national service. This would be something that is a requirement of all young people that when they graduate from high school, some when they graduate from college, they are either uh, responsible to go into the military for usually one or two years, although it could be more, or they're responsible to go into a program that within their own country helps to improve the country. We do not have anything like this in America. The United States has an all-voluntary military. When we have our soldiers around the world, they have volunteered to be soldiers. And so far, we have been able to recruit enough soldiers to meet our needs. We also have no programs that young people are required to participate in in order to do national service within our country to help improve the United States. Honestly, I think that is a mistake. I like the idea that every citizen owes something to his or her country uh, as a citizen to be able to make their country better either to protect it through the military or to improve the standard of living through different programs domestically. The closest thing that the United States has ever come to uh, service that was required is the military draft during the Vietnam War. I was 18 years old in 1969. I will save you the trouble. I am 58 years old. And during that time period, we didn't have a volunteer army. Instead, the federal government sent notices to individuals requiring them to take part in the military. So during the Vietnam War, they had uh, a set of round balls that each had uh, a number on it and another round crank that had a birth date and they matched the number with the birth date. And so number one was this birth date. Number two was this birth date. Number three was this. My number was 196. And as they needed soldiers, they would begin with number one, then they'd go to number two, then they'd go to number three, and continue until they had enough soldiers. During the year that I was eligible, they went to 195. I missed being required to go to Vietnam by one number. I would have gone. I would not have liked to have gone because it was not a good war, but I would have gone. And the people I know who did go, and I have many friends who did serve honorably, you would receive a letter that began this way. Greetings from your president. You are hereby ordered 
to report to this military base on this date at this time. Failure to report may result in a prison sentence. Well, that was pretty straightforward. It, the commander-in-chief of our army said, you are to report and specific information on when. In a sense, it was an order given by a higher authority telling someone under the authority of that person, you have a specific task and you are required to do it. In some ways, that parallels the idea of calling, that God calls us to certain tasks. And as we've mentioned before, there are only two callings in life. One is a calling to salvation, and that's an invitation, not a command. And God invites people, come to me and you will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. Accept Jesus Christ and you will become a child of God. So that applies universally. Every person who's alive on earth has that calling that God calls and says, greetings from God. I invite you to report to me and accept salvation. All right. Those of us watching this, those of us in the classroom, we have responded to that invitation. So we have responded to that calling from a higher authority. But there is a separate calling, and that is the calling to service. That once we have accepted salvation, then God commands us to serve other people. He orders us that now that you are saved, you are my representatives on earth. And because you are my hands, you are my feet, you are my mouth, you are expected to go out and serve your brothers and sisters as well as the larger world on behalf of the kingdom of God. It is in a sense eternal service that instead of national service, we're reporting for duty to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to be his ambassador here on earth. Well, let's begin looking at this calling to service, not the calling to salvation, by looking at Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 and we go down to verse 16. And we're going to look at most every verse along the way to try to understand what does this mean in the sense of our calling to service? When the book of Ephesians was written, Paul was a prisoner in Rome. Most theologians believe that this was not his final imprisonment where he was executed, but that instead it was one of several imprisonments that he had. Then he was released, arrested again, and returned. So in 60 AD, Paul wrote this letter to his beloved church of Ephesus. And he begins with verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord. Then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So he begins by saying, you have a calling, a calling to serve. And I want you to respond to that call. I urge you to live a life that's worthy of being a child of God. Not only in terms of your service, but also in terms of your character, that you become more like Jesus every single day. Well, what would that look like in terms of character? If we had reported to duty and we had followed this plea that Paul gives to live a life worthy of our calling, in verse uh, verse 2, he goes on to say, this is how it would look like. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And that last part, bearing with each other in love, in a paraphrase, the NLT, it says, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. So sometimes when we read some bearing with one another in love, it's not clear to me at least, what does that mean? Sometimes it's helpful to go to the paraphrases. It means I'm a sinner, 
you're a sinner. Let's give each other grace because we love each other as Christ loved us. And then he goes on and he makes a second plea. He says in verse 3, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Throughout his writings, Paul urges, pleads with, begs the church to be united, to not be divided, to not have conflicts, and where they occur, to resolve them quickly so that the unity can be restored. And this last part in the contemporary English version where it talks about the bond of peace says, do this by living in peace. Remain united by you taking responsibility to live in peace. And then he goes on in verses 3 down to verse 6 and he says, we have more that is similar than more that is different. We share some things in common as Christians and therefore we should be united. Notice how many times he uses the word one, united. Starting in verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. By my count, there are seven ones in there. Seven is a divine number. There are two numbers in numerology that are believed to be special numbers that indicate unity. Seven is one of those numbers. And I believe that Paul purposely chose seven things that we have in common under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to emphasize his point that we should be united and not divided. The second number that has significance is the number 12, as in the 12 tribes of Israel, as in the 12 disciples. Again, both numbers represent completeness, unity, wholeness, that we are one. And so he reminds them of seven things that we have in common. And those are the things that should hold us together because there will be many other things that divide us and keep us apart. But these seven things are what we have in common, whether you live in Europe or in Asia, whether you are black or you are white, whether you are rich or you are poor, no matter your condition, if you're a Christian, you have more in common with your brothers and sisters than you have that is not in common with them. Therefore, Paul says, live in unity. Don't fight each other. And so then he goes on and he begins to talk about spiritual gifts. He says that because of this unity and because of your calling, you should unite to serve one another as God has called you to do. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS Ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Now this next section is a little confusing, but I'll try to unpack it so it makes it a little clearer. He says, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. It, grace is translated charisma. He has given us a gift. There are many gifts that God has given us. He's given us the gift of salvation. He's given us the gift of peace. He's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's given us the gift of eternal life. But because Paul is talking about our calling here, he's saying your calling is related to what your spiritual gift is. In other words, the specific purpose God called you to be a Christian is directly tied to what your spiritual gift is. And that within the unity of the body, that gift should be used to help each other in the body so that you can live in peace. You see how this ties together very neatly? 
But then he goes on and he makes it a little more difficult for us to understand. He says, this is why it says in the Old Testament in Psalm 68, 18, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. Huh? You just were talking and it kind of made sense and now you pull out of this verse from the Old Testament. Now I'm a little confused. What does it mean? The he is Jesus. The ascended is he going to heaven. The descended is he coming from heaven down to earth. And so he says, when Jesus was on earth and ascended to heaven, he defeated Satan. Satan could not win. Death had no control over us anymore. Our sins were forgiven. From that point on, Satan was going to lose the battle. There was no way he could win. So he led captives, mean Satan and his allies were now his captives. He no longer had reign and control over all of us as he did previously. And then, as a result, he gave gifts to men. The picture used in Psalm 68, 18 is supposed to be a conqueror who comes to a city, wins the battle, takes what they called the booty, that is, what your enemy owned, his cattle, his sheep, all of his gold and silver. You took all of that and then you divided it up with the soldiers. You gave it to them because they participated in the victory. In that same sense, we participated in the victory because we are in Christ. We're united with him. So that when he won this battle against Satan, he gave us spiritual gifts as a reward to us, as a way of our participating in his victory. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on and makes it a little more confusing. What does he, he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And once again, I look at it and I go, huh? Uh, what does that mean? Well, it, if you take ascending as Jesus going to heaven and descending him coming to earth, he says, when we read this verse, Psalm 68, 18, what does it mean when it says he ascended? It means that Jesus ascended after he had descended to earth. He came to earth and he descended, then he ascended back into earth. So that means that now those of us who are believers have the Holy Spirit within us and that God is God of all the earth. He's above all, he's in all, he's through all. Well, after getting through some difficult passages there, he finally gets to the practical. Instead of going to the academic, he gets to what we call in the United States where the rubber meets the road, meaning this is the point where you can actually start making movement, like a car. The tires are made of rubber, now you can start moving forward. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service. Now you may remember that we've been to this passage many times as we have looked at each of those gifts and each of those offices. In the next session, I'm going to take verses 11 and 13 and I'm going to explain how should the body of Christ operate? What should the body of Christ look like in action? Because these verses are key verses and we really need to understand it so that we know what's our place in the body? Where do we serve? And how should the body be organized so that we make the best and most effective use of the gifts God has given us? So after listing five gifts, and saying that those people should prepare God's people for works of service. Now he tells you, here are the results. If you do this, 
This is what's going to happen in the church. So that the body of Christ may be built up. Built up meaning it will grow in terms of numbers and it will grow in terms of spiritual strength. If you use those gifts and you serve one another, other people will come to Christ. And all who have come to Christ as a body will be stronger than they were before. And then he goes on to say, until we all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. The first part goes back to his plea for unity. And he says, if you do this, you will be united. You won't be divided. Use your gifts to serve each other and unity will occur automatically. And it will be a unity in your faith, in your uh, confidence in, in Christ, as well as your knowledge of him. And then the final thing he says that will happen is we will become mature. And when he says attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, he means one day we will actually look like Jesus Christ. Not here on earth, but when we go and we're with him in heaven, we will be as he is, fully mature, fully like Christ. In some of that passage, he says, if you use your gifts, and if those five gifts prepare all of the rest of God's people to do works of service, the church will grow stronger, the church will be united, the church will be mature. And in verses 14 through 16, he uses some examples as he's done before. He says, therefore, you will no longer be infants. You won't be baby Christians who are tossed back and forth by the waves and blowed here and there by every wind of teaching and by every cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful schemes. He says, right now you're infants. And unless you use your gift, you're going to stay infants. And as a result, Every time somebody comes and preaches something new, a new idea, a new belief, one that might either be scriptural or one that might be false teachings, you will be what James calls in his first chapter, a double-minded man going, huh, yeah, I think that's right. No, this person said that. Yeah, I, I think that's, no. This person said this, and I kind of like what that person says. In other words, you can't make up your mind because you're babies. You don't know what's right. He says, if you use your gifts, you will know what your beliefs are. And therefore, wicked people who are deceitful, who are cunning, who are crafty, won't be able to teach you things that aren't true according to the Bible. So you will be like a rock, able to say, this then is what I believe. And then he goes on into a part that we will really dive into next time. Very famous little uh, phrase. Instead, speaking the truth in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. That if we learn how to tell each other the truth, but we tell it in love, then we will become more like Christ-like. And in the last part he says, and then from him the whole body will be joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does the work. That like a body, if each person does its part, the body will be healthy, it will be strong, it will be vigorous, it will be able to be effective. So in all of this, Paul emphasizes unity. He emphasizes that we can experience that unity if we use our spiritual gifts, that there are benefits to the church for using those gifts. Among them would be growth numerically as well as in strength. 
it would be uh, not only growth in terms of that, but also unity, and then finally maturity. And then he gives some examples. You will know what you believe, so nobody can persuade you some of something different, and that finally the body will become more like Jesus Christ in every moment. Well, in the next session, we're going to go back and we're going to look more in depth at just verses 11 through 13. This is a key passage of spiritual gifts. There are two that I believe are the foundation of understanding spiritual gifts. One is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. And the other is right here, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13. In the following session, we'll go and we'll take a look at verses 14 to 16. Thank you for being with us and please join us next time.